For RCR TV, I'm Joey Jackson. On this episode of Cell Tower News, I'll discuss FirstNet with industry analyst Wade Sarver. He'll tell us the issues the next generation public safety network faces in execution of a large scale deployment. That and the latest in the tower industry news. Stay tuned. Today's episode is brought to you by Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board, telecomcareers.net. For 20 years, Nate has been the undisputed global leader in safety, standards, and education for the wireless and broadcast communications infrastructure industries. All right, welcome back to Cell Tower News, where we discuss the backbone of the wireless world. Before we go into the heart of our discussion about FirstNet, let's check in with Jared Matula, writer of the Cell Tower Wrap column on rcrwireless.com to see what's happening in the tower industry. What's new, Jared? Thanks, Joey. We start with news this week related to drones. In addition to increasing prominence in the wireless industry, they're all the rage in annoying GoPro videos, Muse albums, and government-sponsored murder. The National Association of Tower Rectors recently established an unmanned aerial system committee to monitor trends and regulations in the drone industry. It will use the information to inform NATE members and the wireless infrastructure industry as a whole on best practices when implementing the technology into tower repair, maintenance, inspection, and construction strategy. As many of you know, drones could play a pivotal role in the tower industry moving forward. In a previous episode of this show, RCR talked with precision drone company called PreNav about applications of precision drones in tower inspections. We also spoke with Nate Headman, Todd Schleckaway, about the role he sees the technology playing moving forward. As a quick refresher, let's take a quick look at what Todd had to say in an earlier episode of Cell Tower News. Let's not be under any illusions, regardless of how technology advances. Drones aren't going to replace the sophisticated skills of, of the workers right now. I mean, the last time I checked, drones aren't going to be able to do antenna and line sweeps anytime soon and structural modifications. So I always try to temper people's perspective when I first talk to them. But can they be a valuable tool in the toolbox? I, I would certainly think so. I think when it comes to the capacity to take photos, site photos, uh, closeout inspection photos, you know, all of those things come into play. And maybe it does over time, Joey, reduce the number of times the worker needs to climb up and down the tower, you know, for, for taking a photo or doing something. So it's an issue we're, we're watching very closely. Right now, the FAA is, is finalizing um, kind of what's going to be the, the, the playing rules, the, the game plan, so to speak, for if, if you're not a pilot and you want to operate a drone in our industry, you know, what type of test are you going to have to take? All that is currently being sorted out at the FAA, and it sounds like, you know, sometime in 2016 we may get some clarity. In other news, California approved a law that would essentially set a shot clock for tower applications to be approved or rejected. The new law follows rules laid out in the FCC's 2009 shot clock order, which sets timelines for decisions on new cell sites or for co-location on existing sites. The law specified new cell site builds must be approved or rejected within 150 days and decisions on co-locations must be made within 90 days. California joins other states in enacting time limits to speed up the construction process for wireless infrastructure to keep up with increasing demands for wireless coverage. The California Wireless Association sees the law as a critical tool to facilitate widespread construction of much-needed wireless facilities throughout the state of California. The law is set to take effect on January 1st of 2016. For more news like this on the tower industry, check out my Cell Tower News Wrap every Friday on rcrwireless.com. Back to you, Joey. All right, as always, thanks for that, Jared. Now let's talk about why we're here. FirstNet is a very important topic for the tower industry and the country as a whole for that matter. What happens in the next few years will determine the next decade or so of our public safety infrastructure. It's with great pleasure that I bring in Wade Sarver to discuss this issue, a man with a lot of knowledge of the tower industry who produces tons of informative content on his website, uh, wadeforwireless.com. First of all, Wade, let's get to know you a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about your background. 
spent about 25 years in wireless. I, uh, I, w I was actually in paging in the early days, which I don't know if anyone really knows what a pager is anymore. <laughs> but I did paging. I did uh, land mobile radio, mobile phone when you had to log on with your uh, keypad, uh, you know, before the concept of cellular. Then you had the mobile telephone system. I did a lot of wireless internet, backhaul. I had a lot of different jobs, technician, as an RF engineer, tower climber, just a lot of different things. A lot of things mostly with deployment and working in the field. All right, very good, Wade. And you have a website that you operate called wadeforwireless.com, as I mentioned, where you talk about issues in the tower industry. How, how did all that come about? It, it, it's really a, a hobby I enjoy. I just like to talk about wireless issues. I know it sounds, to a lot of people, it sounds a little crazy, but there were a lot of issues out there that people just didn't talk about. Uh, I, I, I talk about tower climbing a lot because there's a lot of issues in tower climbing that, that people don't want to bring to the surface, you know, and a lot of people avoid a lot of the issues and really a lot of tower climbers, they don't talk about safety the way they should. Now it's more and more out in the open, let's say. The training, the issues with training and people not being properly trained, it's coming out in the open. It's, it's really something that we need to talk about to correct the problem. You know, we can't just shut our eyes and deny it. So I think, and the getting paid issue, that's another issue. People just don't want to talk about it. And I get it. It's money and customers. But fortunately, I, I can talk about all that. <laughs> and you recently wrote an article about FirstNet deployment. Can you give me some background on what FirstNet is and why it's important to our public safety infrastructure? FirstNet's really cool. It's going to be an LTE system nationwide where the federal government allocated uh, band 14, 700 megahertz, and it's just a broadband network. And I, I'm excited about the concept and the idea of a nationwide network. Public safety is going to have their own, basically their own bandwidth for video. And, and it's for video, for data, everything you have on your smartphone, only it's dedicated to public safety. And I think it's important because the government needs to have a means to get their data across. And it's going to be more than data. Eventually, they'll use a voice, they'll have apps. I mean, it, it'll, be a whole e it'll be a whole ecosystem where they'll use it for everything. And that's why it's important because if you've ever been in an emergency by a cell site, the site gets taken down. You have emergency responders trying to use it. You have everybody trying to use the same cell sites. No matter who it is, all the carriers, they just get overloaded. And this is something where public safety will have top priority. And as you know, Wade, a major issue for FirstNet deployment is whether it should be left to the states or whether it should be a sweeping federal deployment. Recently, the FirstNet board decided to only accept national deployment offers. What are your thoughts on that? Let's talk about a couple different things. Um, let's go with the state versus FirstNet. I feel if the states were allowed to do it, you'd be all over the place. I do agree with that. It might not be a constant network, and I get that. I, I see where the federal government's coming from when they established FirstNet. However, I guarantee you there would have been two or three states that would have a system built by now, <laughs> and that's just the way I feel because I know, uh, I, I know the state of Oklahoma, they were ready to deploy something, I, I want to say three, maybe four years ago, and FirstNet stepped in. I'm not blaming FirstNet. They, I mean, it's just a, it's a federal government move. But they stepped in and said, no, we're going to build a federal network. You're not going to do it. So I think the states would be farther ahead, in my opinion. I, we don't know for sure. But then there would be some states that would have no interest and wouldn't have done anything at all, at least until the, gov the federal government would pay for it. So I, I don't know. I get it. It makes sense. But I think FirstNet uh, forming that was a good idea. I think the people have a learning curve, and I don't mean any disrespect by that. I have a learning curve. You know, it's just something that's new. It's a federal funded program. And when things are done in government, they tend to take longer to do. All right. And so what other obstacles is FirstNet facing? They have a lot of obstacles. The learning curve is a big one. Trying to get everybody on board is a big one. And doing the national thing, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, by, by just bidding it out to national, I get where they're coming from. It's FirstNet. They only have so many people, so many resources. Uh, it's, it's like some states don't have the resources to build and maintain a network, you know. So basically, they have managed services do it. And I think with FirstNet, that's why they went national. I feel like they may have made a mistake because CCA, the members of CCA, all the rural carriers, they would have been great. They would have been uh, really... 
uh, in my opinion, to do the rural build out where first nips required to build, they would have been a key partner. But I think by going nationwide, now you're relying on whatever companies say the, the Bechtels, the, the general dynamics, the, the companies that can handle something that big, you're relying on them and their processes to build something out. Uh, and they decide to build. If they decide to partner with them, things will be great. I, I think that would be the way to go, but I, I don't know if they want to. I just don't know. And Wade, is it possible for FirstNet to sustain the network financially by selling services to public safety groups in the States? That's a great question. They think they can, and maybe they can. They have a business plan. They have $7 billion to start. And let me tell you something. I, that's, that's a phenomenal amount of money. Don't get me wrong. But $7 billion is a start. It's not going to build a nationwide system, especially not to cover the real estate that they want to cover. They have to cover so much in the state. It's just so much, in at least $30 billion. And I base that off what AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile have done. And Sprint and T-Mobile uh, found ways to build out for good cost and they partnered with people, right? They, they really don't have a nationwide system. So I, I, I just think I, you know, I don't know what to say. It, it's, it's a tough decision. I think it would have been better to do it regionally. I think it would have made more sense. And can this deployment happen without the help of a major carrier? Well, if you have the money, anything can happen. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. You know, I, I'm not being a wise guy there. I mean, honestly, it's a federal government. If they want it to happen, I, I really believe it'll happen. But I think it would happen more efficiently, smoother, and probably better if they were to go with, if AT&T or Verizon Wireless were to partner with them, I'll be, I don't know if Sprint and T-Mobile want to do that. I mean, that, I, I, I can't wait to find out when they do the RFP to see what they're going to do. I, I think Sprint has enough problems. Their hands are full. I think T-Mobile, I don't know if T-Mobile wants the headaches in all honesty. You know, they're a lean and mean machine. So I think really the ones that could handle it, AT&T and Verizon, if they, part, if they decided to take it on, I think it'd be great. And here are the pros and cons. If they decide to take it on and the build happens, it would be good for FirstNet because the sites are there, the experience is there, the know-how is there. They can do everything. They would know how to partner with people in the rural areas. And they also have their set of contractors. And it would be good for, in my opinion, with one of those two carriers, it'd, it'd be good for everyone all the way around. Don't parse of that that would manage it and their contractors, and they may not have the experience. They may be good at managing these large projects, but a nationwide system is huge. So I, I, I think Verizon and AT&T, if they want to take it on, all the downside is for Verizon and AT&T, anytime there's a problem or something goes bad, it's a federal government. They're going to say, well, we partnered with these guys and not saying they'll point the finger, but they will. They'll point the finger. They'll say, you know, it's these guys did this wrong, did this wrong. If a site goes down in an emergency, they're going to say, well, Verizon Wireless, their site went down, something of that nature. And I'm not, I'm not being a wise guy because it, it probably wouldn't be FirstNet that said it. It would probably be like you and me, <laughs> talking, me on my blog and you, you and RCR TV talking about it and saying, you know, the site went down and it was Verizon's site. And they really could have done more. And Verizon may not want the black eye or AT&T. They may not want the black eye. So what would the backhaul network look like? Again, it depends who builds it. If, if, again, if you have a large carrier build it, they would just expand their backhaul. Unless they had to have a dedicated backhaul, they would just add into what they already have. So it would be good for their vendors. If a contractor builds it, a nationwide contractor, I think what FirstNet's going to do, and this is my opinion, I think they'll try to partner with the states. I know for a fact a lot of states already have their own fiber network, wireless network. They have a lot of things in place, and it would be silly to recreate the wheel. They should just use what they have, and the way that would work with the states, the money would change hands. So the states would pay for airtime the devices, and then FirstNet would pay for the backhaul charges to the states. And to me, that would be a win-win. It would just be a win-win for those guys because it would, you know, the money would pass back and forth between agencies. Now, um, on the other hand, if they try to build all new backhaul, I just, with vendors, which I think they'll have to do to a point, oh, it'll be so much money. And I, 
that that seven billion dollars is going to get sucked up pretty quick. And and again, 30, 35 billion turns to forty billion because it's a nationwide network. And nobody can really solve all the problems. That's right. See the members of CC Air, you know, whatever it is, a cable system, microwave, whatever they have to do. So I, I think the backhaul network obviously will be a mix of fiber and wireless and copper, probably even cable modems. And I think they'll just have to figure out who they're going to partner with. And it's a nationwide network. They'll have tons of partners, just tons of partners. All right, Wade. And finally, look into your crystal ball for us. When will we see a large scale first net deployment? Well, here's the way I see the timeline. The RFP is coming out at the end of this year. That'll take three to six months. We'll take three months to really absorb it and possibly do the bidding and everything and then say, and then there'll be issues after that. And what FirstNet's going to have to do, so now we're into 2016. We're going to say we're at the start of third quarter, 2016. At the start of third quarter, what I think what FirstNet's going to have to do is vet whoever wins. They're going to have to go through and make sure, can you do this? Do you have a plan? And then you got three more months of putting a plan together. And then possibly by the end of the year, they'll have a plan and they'll be ready to actually start working with vendors. So I would say it'll ramp up in 2017, probably in the beginning, first quarter. I would say it would hit full force probably third quarter of 2017. So third quarter of 2017, all the way through to 2020, I would say they'll be deploying. All right. Thank you to Wade Sarver for all that great insight. We'll definitely be having Wade back on again to pick his brain about other issues in the industry. But to close the show, let's, let's check in with what's trending in the Facebook tower climber groups as we always do. As I'm sure any tower climber can attest to, bees like to make their homes on towers. This video from Chris Barely, I hope that I pronounced that right, uh, shows a group of wasps who, who aren't too happy that he invaded their home. The caption says, got stung five times. So yeah, obviously they, they weren't very happy about that. He asked uh, for suggestions on how others deal with bees on the towers and got some pretty good feedback. Um, one person suggests carb cleaner or wasp killer, which makes sense. Other, suggests, other suggestions include a pump tank sprayer and Dawn dish soap mixed with water, uh, foggers attached to a 10-foot EMT stick, and perhaps most dramatically, <laughs> many suggested gasoline and a lighter. I'm not so sure about <laughs> that last one, but definitely some creative solutions to a big pain in the ass. <laughs> well, that's all for us, or for me. We'll, uh, I hope you learned something, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. Cell Tower News is a production of RCR-TV. To reach Joey Jackson or suggest a show topic for Cell Tower News, contact him at jjackson at rcrwireless.com or on Twitter at duck underscore Jackson. For more Cell Tower News, please visit rcrwireless.com.